Hello. It's really, it's really delayed on my end. It's going really slow on your end. Hi, Una. Thank you for joining me. Um, okay. I'm here right now. Apologize for the delay. We've been having some technical difficulties. Um, we will be joined by Priyanka as well. She's just having some Wi-Fi issues. So um, I'm just going to wait a second before we start, and then I'll go into the introductions. Can you ask? All right, um, I'm hoping this is working. Uh, if you are on the call, feel free to write a comment on the chat function on the right-hand side or to tweet your questions at, uh, at the IWMF using the hashtag convos with journos. Um, we're gonna have some live Q&A um, in, a, in a bit, so we would love to get your questions. Um, to begin, I'd just like to start by introducing myself. My name is Claudia Gonzalez, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm a senior program coordinator at the IWMF, and I manage the Elizabeth Newford Fellowship, in addition to working on the organization's Latin American programming. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I apologize for our late start. Um, and I'm joined today by two brilliant human rights reporters and IWMF Elizabeth Newford Fellows, and we're very excited to speak with you today. Um, I have Una on the call with me right now, and we're hoping that Priyanka's Wi-Fi will work so she can join us shortly. Um, but before I hand it over to them, I'm going to be asking them some questions. I'd like to start by just providing some background information on the Elizabeth Newford Fellowship. Um, so all this information can also be found on our website at iwmf.org, but I'm just going to provide a quick background in case you're new to this program. 
The Elizabeth Neufer Fellowship was created in memory of the Boston Globe correspondent and IWF Courage and Journalism Award winner Elizabeth Neufer, who died while reporting in Iraq in 2003. In collaboration with Elizabeth's family and friends, IDMF started this program to honor her legacy while advancing her work in the fields of human rights and social justice. This is the IWMF's largest annual fellowship opportunity. Each year, the fellowship begins in Washington, D.C. with an IWMF orientation. By September 1st, the fellow moves to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and for the first five months from September until the end of January, um, they are a research associate in residence at MIT's Center for International Studies, where they complete... Um, where they also complete independent research. At the same time, the fellow works at the Boston Globe. Historically, this has been in the opinion section. This portion of the fellowship is highly flexible and customizable. You'll hear about that some more from Priyanka and Una. Um, but in the past, fellows have taken two to three courses at MIT and other area universities, attended academic lectures and events, completed a wide array of research projects, and reported two to three days a week at the Boston Globe. By February 1st, the fellow moves to New York City for the second portion of the fellowship. In New York, they usually work full time for the New York Times for about six to eight weeks. The fellowship concludes the last week of March in Washington, DC. So that's the structure of the fellowship, although it looks very different for each um, individual who completes it. Our current fellow, Una, is wrapping up her fellowship next month. And at this time, we're accepting applications for the IWMF's 2019 Elizabeth Neufer Fellow via our online application system submittable. The deadline to apply is March 7th, 2019, and the IWMF links to this application on our website. So just in case you're wondering whether you're eligible, we get a lot of questions about eligibility for this opportunity. We ask that you please consider the criteria that are detailed in the application. This fellowship is designed for staff or freelance journalists who identify as women and have three or more years of professional experience working full-time in news media. In this case, internships do not count towards that experience. Um, we accept journalists of all nationalities, and however, non-native English speakers must be proficient in English in order to fully participate in and benefit from the program. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Una, who's on the call with, with me right now, um, and hopefully I'll be able to introduce Priyanka shortly. Um, Una is an independent print and TV journalist from Pristina. She covers politics, minorities, nationalism, inter-ethnic tensions, right-wing groups, and hate speech in the Western Balkans, and began her journalism career in post-conflict Kosovo, focusing on the lingering tensions between the Serbian and Albanian communities in her country. Una, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm actually here in the Elizabeth Neufer room at the New York Times. Um, they dedicated a whole conference room here to her, and I hope you guys will be able to come here personally and see both the, the impressive NYT building and also the Elizabeth Neufer room. So like Claudia said, um, I'm, I focus on nationalism, right-wing groups, sort of stuff that is um, quite popular in Europe right now, and uh, I tried to combine my experience in working as a freelancer for US outlets in Europe um, with my experience here in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, we could go into the details of it, but may, let's start with the questions just so we have a structure of some sort. Awesome. So prior to starting the Elizabeth Neufer Fellowship last August, what were you working on? Um, I was working on um, sort of uh, ethnic tensions in between in Croatia and Serbia. Um, uh, sort of uh, Serbia is involved in an in intense political dialogue with Kosovo and that stuff keeps brewing sort of and, and causing new tensions um, and I, I was also based in Croatia for a while um, because of this was right after the World Cup in, in, in football and I was covering local sort of um, nationalist and right-wing groups that were excited about their country doing well in soccer and combined that with a lot of, a lot of other stuff. Um, I can send you all the articles if you're interested. Thank you. Um, and now that you've been the Newfer Fellow for six months, could you provide a high over high level overview of your experience so far? Um, for example, what were your goals going into this fellowship and how, how has that gone for you? Well, I've combined my experience so far both between being in newsrooms and also like so working full time for news organizations and being a freelancer. Um, and most of my writing um, from the start was for English language outlets. That means for outlets based in the US and the UK mainly. Um, 
uh, or uh, which have international coverage, of course. And this, what this did was sort of give me an opportunity to sort of actually be based within the newsrooms of organi newspapers and organ media organizations that are similar to the ones that I've worked with for and see the other side um, of the whole spectrum, especially, if, um, which is interesting for journalists who are usually based in Europe. Um, and um, the Boston part of it or the Cambridge part of the fellowship also enabled me to uh, follow a lot of lectures and panels and stuff. Um, I approached it quite flexibly. I, I think there was one course I took in, in full, but I uh, spent a lot of time going to these extremely diverse and informative panels that would take place um, in Cambridge, both at MIT and other um, uh, academic institutions in the area. And now at the Times, I come here every day in the morning <laughs> for every single editorial meeting, which is one of the most exciting things ever. I get to, I literally sit in a room with where, similarly to this, where um, we have hangouts with all the different um, news desks in the world from Hong Kong uh, to Europe, to the London news desk, to other bureaus and correspondents who are reporting for the New York Times all over. And I get to, get to um, listen to that and um, see it before it um, ends up in print and all that kind of stuff. Obviously not tell anyone, but um, <laughs> what's well, gonna be the big next big international story. But it's been fascinating. And, and of course the editors have also, here at the Times have also um, taken me into meetings um, for the A1, so the front page of the New York Times or other uh, sections and, and sectors desks here. Thank you, those are really um, exciting <laughs> tidbits. Um, do you have a favorite memory so far from the fellowship? Um, my favorite memory was definitely when I was working, when I was at the Boston Globe, um, we pushed out an editorial. This was something that um, about a political um, dissident who is in the United States um, currently or has been for, for a long time. And this was at a point in October of last year when um, President Trump was um, forming sort of a closer um, so October and after that, we're forming sort of a closer bond with the Turkish president Erdogan following the Khashoggi murder. So I was right at the heart of covering this issue. And he, um, the, uh, the Trump administration started indicating that they were going to extradite this person and take him out to Turkey. And while people at the editorial board of the Boston Globe did follow this from afar, none of them had followed it up close as I had, um, uh, or it followed the influence of this um, political dis dissident outside of Turkey up close as I had. And we, we were able to do a quick turnaround on this. And not only uh, did the editorial get a lot of traction, it also caused a reaction from the Turkish embassy here who wanted uh, the boss of Globe to sort of issue an apology and revoke it and stuff. So that was interesting. Really being part of a newspaper to, to the point where <laughs> you attract hate for them, <laughs> just like any journalist <laughs> would. That's funny. And also, I have to say, we republish all of the work of the New for Fellow as well as our other fellows on the IWMF's website. So if you want to see any of the work that Una is referring to, you can read that on at IWMF.org. So I'm going to jump into a little bit about the application process, just providing some background information. Mm -hmm. um, currently, as I mentioned, we're accepting applications for our 15th annual Elizabeth New for Fellow, and the deadline is approaching on March 7th. As always, applications must be submitted through our online system submittable, and the link to submittable can be found on our website. That application, but you can also see that pretty easily yourself by going on to submittable. After filling in your personal information, the application will ask you to provide a statement of interest. This year, we tried to break that statement of interest down into more precise questions to elicit more detailed responses. You will need to explain why this is a good time in your career to participate in the Elizabeth Newford Fellowship what is the single most important goal you hope to achieve with the fellowship and why, and how this goal will improve your journalism on human rights and social justice issues, as well as what your long-term career ambitions are. After that, you'll be asked to elaborate on your fellowship goals, including the subjects that you would like to research and how they relate to your career objectives, what skills you would like to develop at the Globe and the New York Times, and how they will advance your career objectives, as well as any other aspirations or expectations that you may have for the fellowship. These questions may seem really broad or open-ended, but that speak, really speaks to the highly customizable nature of the fellowship. And so this is really your time to explain how you would design your fellowship experience. You will also be asked to provide links to two work samples that demonstrate your best work covering human rights and social justice issues, preferably published within the last two years. If your work samples are not online, you also have the option to upload the files. 
this is a question we get a lot. If your work samples are not in English, we just ask that you upload your own translations along with a professional translator's assessment of their accuracy. So it's perfectly all right to have non-English work samples. We just need that translation for the selection committee. We also like to note that if either of your work samples include a joint byline, you'll need to explain in detail your contributions to the story. Furthermore, you'll be asked to provide two letters of recommendation that attest to your journalistic abilities, capacity for academic work, and professional and personal character. Your letters should also provide an assessment of your commitment to promoting human rights and social justice issues through your reporting. So all this information can be found on the submittable application. Um, one of our tips that we like to share for ap applying for this opportunity is to make sure you get your application started in advance um, because there are a lot of components. It is a large opportunity, so it is a long application. <laughs> we don't wanna discourage you. We just ask that you start sooner than later because you will need to request those letters of recommendation. Um, a little bit about the behind the scenes of the selection process. The selection process is carried out by the IWMF and the Elizabeth Newfer Fellowship Committee, which includes family and friends of Elizabeth. There's more information about the committee on the IWMF's website, including the committee members' bios. The selection process takes about two and a half months because there are five rounds of review. The IWMF does the first round of review, scanning applications for eligibility and completion. Afterwards, volunteer readers will um, read about 10 applications and select their top three, creating a pool of about, of about 25 semifinalists. For the third round, the IWMF and the NUFER committee cuts down the pool of semifinalists to six quarter finalists. Then through a voting process, we narrow down the quarter finalists to three finalists. By mid-May, we interview each finalist in order to select that year as NUFER fellow. As you can see, it's an extremely difficult decision-making process due to the very competitive nature of the application pool. Since there's only one fellow each year, the acceptance rate is very low. Last year, UNO was selected out of a batch of 127 applicants. And to give you a little bit more information about the selection criteria that the committee members will be considering while reviewing applications, there's some questions we ask them to consider. So examples of these questions are, how does the applicant's work advance human rights and social justice goals, and how will the fellowship help her achieve these? What are the applicant's career goals, and how will the new for fellowship, fellowship help her advance these goals? How will the fellowship enrich the applicant as a human being, and what is she hoping to gain from the fellowship? What kind of research slash academic subjects interest the applicant and why? How will research enrich her journalism? How well has the applicant defined the sort of journalism experience she would like to have at the New York Times and the Boston Globe? Has she identified the media outlets and the subject matter she is most interested in? Has the applicant shown how her time at the Globe and the New York Times would further her journalistic experience, skills, and contacts? And how aligned are the work samples with human rights slash social justice issues? Those are just a handful of the questions that we consider while reviewing the application, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to the strength of the content in the application. So I'm gonna um, have a few more questions for Una. Um, and if you're on this uh, webinar right now, always feel free to use the group chat function to leave a question, or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag convos with journos. Um, Una will be taking any questions from the audience today. so. Um, please ask your questions now. <laughs> um, so Una, I would like to know from you um, what you think prospective applicants should consider when writing their fellowship goals. Um, I think it's really important to have in mind that this is a journalism fellowship and fellowship, journalist fellowships are different. Journalism fellowships are different from most fellowships in the sense that um, the organization is there to provide you with all the stuff you need to get set up in the United States, um, um, provide introductions to news outlets, um, that both the ones you're working with and other ones, um, help you transition, help you perhaps get sources if you need them. But your goal is um, to craft your own experience to the, to the extent that you need to think of your own stories, you need to think of how you want to, um, how you can contribute to the Boston Globe um, and how you can contribute to the New York Times. These two outlets are different. They're different in what they cover. They're different in the way they cover it. Um, I enjoyed both a lot, but you need to be able, I encourage fellows to, to be proactive or potential fellows to be proactive and to read the Boston Globe, to sort of scan the newspaper, just like when you're usually pitching and be see what sort of topics they cover, how they cover them, 
um, and stuff like that. Um, same same thing goes for the New York Times. You have to be pro proactive and and see how your expertise and your the knowledge you have from your part of the world can fit into their coverage, um, their existing coverage. Um, newspapers. Uh, we're all professional journalists, so no, nobody will come in and, and teach you how to, I mean, of course, you'll get wonderful opportunities to have your um, articles edited by people who are some of the best news editors in the world. Um, here at the Times, it goes through at least two levels of editing, if not more, which means that my piece is so polished, I can, um, I've, I've never had more polished pieces and they're wonderful. Um, so that's, that's the mentoring experience and that's the learning, the part of the, the fellowship that will involve learning new things, but no one's going to go and find the articles for you, the topics for you, the things that will fit in. And this is actually a, sort of a test to see as to how, how um, to what extent you're able to fit into, into the newsrooms of, of these two newspapers. Thank you. And I see that we're joined now by Priyanka. Priyanka, thank you for coming on. Um, I know we were experiencing some technical difficulties, um, but I'd like to introduce you and just go back um, to have you introduce yourselves as well. So for the audience, um, Priyanka is an independent journalist from India and she was the IWMF's 2012 Elizabeth Newfer Fellow. And Priyanka, without further ado, would you like to introduce yourself and um, provide a little bit of background on your fellowship experience in 2012? Yep. Thanks, Claudia. And hi, Una. I'm so sorry. I'm a bit late. Uh, we were having some technical issues and I just got roped into um, a last minute interview appointment and I just had to extricate myself from it. Um, I had a great time uh, with the fellowship. Uh, prior to the fellowship, I had been a journalist for five years, out of which three years was dedicated to extensive human rights and justice-related stories. And I think that was the, uh, the reason why I think I was able to really uh, perhaps frame a proper um, you know, application and to be able to take uh, you know, um, a, a step back from my active reporting of those years and to really see what does my reporting um, uh, mean in a larger context of similar issues in the world. So I have been reporting about indigenous people's rights and how their lands are being taken over by corporations uh, with, in, in, uh, in, in cahoots with um, with politicians and, and state militia. And once I came to the US, which is the first time I was visiting of, uh, you know, I was visiting the Western hemisphere, I realized, well, this is, this is pretty much the history of the USA. So it was very interesting for me to uh, draw those linkages between what was happening in India that I was reporting about with what was happening in the US. Unlike Una, who was, uh, who's already a very accomplished journalist right now at the time of uh, this fellowship, I was an accomplished fellowship, but then I just had three years into uh, human rights reporting. Uh, and so this fellowship was really helpful for me to really understand how my work mattered in a broader uh, international sphere of these similar issues. I think the highlight of, the, of my fellowship time was being able to audit various courses across the Boston area as well as uh, sitting in the office of Boston Globe and just listening to <clears throat> uh, journalists there uh, debating in a, in a beautiful way about how they should frame the opinion pieces on important issues that um, uh, that were developing in, in, in the country at that time. There were several, um, you know, uh, shootings, mass shootings, and um, uh, which was really predominantly, uh, you know, the, the, the conversation and, and how one ought to address it. And then the Boston bomb blast also, uh, Boston Marathon bomb blast had also taken place. And so it was very interesting for me to see how those debates were shaping up. And, and I was extremely fortunate that Peter Candelos would always ask me, is there something you'd like to also add in? And I was able to then see how something that was happening in India um, uh, correlated to what's happening in the world or why it mattered. So I think that was a very amazing experience. I think the last thing that I'd like to add was that when I would like write out my opinion pieces, which was the first time I was doing that because I'm a hardcore reporter and I kind of freaked out writing opinion pieces, uh, Peter just took my copy and just copy edited them 
which means that he did not question me once about my facts. He just just took them uh, knowing that I was a reporter and just copy edited them for length. That to me was huge because it meant that I had immense responsibility uh, as a journalist to really present my facts correctly, especially to an international audience. So I think uh, that definitely emboldened me as a journalist to be able to always put the best copy uh, uh, before your ed editor and not assuming that your editor is going to come back to you asking, is this fact correct? That onus list just lies on you. So even though I had that principle as a journalist always, it just emboldened me and just uh, helped me develop that furthermore. Thank you. Um, and could you let us know what you've been up to since completing the Newfer Fellowship? Uh, well, I can just tell you very quickly what I've been up to right now, because then that'll just be easier. So I just completed walking about 220 kilometers across a part of India. I've been walking with two-time Pulitzer winning journalist Paul Salupek on his um, epic Out of Eden walk, which traces the route of human migration. And it's funny because um, he started the walk in 2013, and I had met him at Harvard during my new fellowship. And I remember attending a talk and, uh, uh, about him launching this walk, and I remember telling him that, hey, when you come to my side of the world, I'm going to walk with him. Six years down the line, guess what? I am actually walking with him. So that's what I've been doing right now. But then right after the fellowship, I have continued on with my journalism, being able to make broader linkages with my work, writing for more international publications. I've had quite a few other fellowships also. Uh, I think what the New for Fellowship did for me was to just uh, develop my confidence as a journalist reporting on human rights issues from India and has brought me to a level where I feel I'm able to report on human rights issues from across the world based on my experiences of doing the same reporting from India itself. Wow, that's So amazing. I've been a Fulbright Fellow. Yeah, so I've been a Fulbright Fellow in 2016. I've had a fellowship in Germany, another one reporting from El Salvador. Um, a lot and a lot of emotional and personal ups and downs, but I think throughout I've, uh, I, I kind of built myself a family back in Boston, which has always seen me through, um, you know, throughout all these years. And I, and I think it's a, it's a really unique experience that I had. Thank you. It's amazing to see how what you're working on now ties back to your fellowship in 2012. Um, and so I did provide an overview of the application and some of the questions that the committee members consider while evaluating applications, but I would love to know from you what you think prospective applicants should consider when writing their fellowship goals. I know you receive a lot of questions each year um, because we have a tight knit cohort and everyone's like, Priyanka, I would love your advice. So if you could share some of that advice on today's webinar, that would be really great for everyone. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, one of the great things of, of, of being a woman journalist is that many other women journalists feel that they can really reach out to you and ask you for advice, which is fabulous. But it also means that I'm a professional journalist and I'm not able to respond to everyone individually, while at the same time, I really do not know your work as a journalist for me to be able to comment and guide you on how you know this this fellowship is going to be helpful to you or not so i think that's uh, that, that's primarily the essence of this webinar which i hope uh, which hopefully is going to be helpful for a, a lot of fantastic women journalists who are working on issues of human rights and justice or who are just you know tipping their toes into it um i think uh the first thing is to really question yourself why are you uh, applying for this fellowship and do you really see that you have definitely been reporting on issues of human rights and justice for a long time now and and of course for me that long time was three years but I think it was something in part of me inside me which felt that I think I really know my subject well enough. So if you just sit me down and tell me what's, okay, tell me Priyanka, what's happening in India right now with this particular context of land grab, of, of, of people of uh, living in forests, I think I could just speak for two hours over coffee and beer. So I, I, I had that sense of confidence in that subject that I was reporting about. And I definitely encourage journalists to really ask themselves, is that something? Uh, that, that that she also feels about her work. Uh, 
this fellowship uh, might seem like it's a great opportunity to just mingle around uh, and meet a lot of people from Boston and New York. Yes, it is, but but it's like well earned. And so what I'm trying to say is that you have to feel that you have a command over your work. But that, of course, doesn't mean that you have to be doing that for like, you know, um, you know, on, only a specific amount of time. But I think all of us have that uh, that inner muscle that just tells us what definitely helps. What's also necessary is to see that where do you see yourself in a few years? What are, and I'm being honest, what is it that you'd love to really learn, you know, by like taking a step back from your active work? If you have this golden opportunity to really learn from some of the world's experts uh, and also be able to perhaps debate with them, uh, is, is that something that you see for yourself? And what is it that you're really curious to learn about? I think that's very important to write in your application and say that um, this this is what I'd like to learn because this is how it's going to help me in the work that I'm going to do henceforth. And this is why my work is different. But do not try to prove yourself to be very different just for the sake of it. Uh, because... At, in, because in the end, all human rights issues are human rights issues. Sometimes it's just a difference of a location or of a situation. But truly, what is different in your narrative? Uh, I think that is, it, it really boils down to being truly honest with yourself about your own work and and why you are seeking this fellowship. Of course, this fellowship I see it sounds very romantic and beautiful, and it is, but... Um, but the very fact that IWMF chooses just one uh, one journalist every year, it just speaks for how prestigious it is and how well-deserved it is. Uh, at the time that I had applied, there were 85 international applicants, and I was selected, so I felt quite like the Miss Universe without having to <laughs> cut down on the cakes that I'm eating. But then at the same time, I knew the other two journalists were the runners-up, so to speak, and they've done fabulous work too. So... Uh, Really be honest with yourself and ask yourself, what is it that you're applying for? What is it that you can learn the most from this opportunity? Thank you. That was very helpful. And um, we also received some questions in the comments um, that were very specific about the application process. So I'm just going to go into those now. If anyone listening has more questions, yeah. you can leave um, additional comments or you can also tweet your questions. And we still have a couple more questions to get through on our end, but I would like to just address these questions about the application process. Um, Una, could you address, um, someone asked, what are the outlets and events you can access as a fellow and can, um, can that include visits to NGOs or other media outlets? Um, yes, definitely. I spent my first week in DC, um, meeting up with outlets, um, that I'd, I mean, me meetings, which I'd coordinated with, with Claudia or she'd organized. I'd met with the Washington post, um, with the intercept, with the Atlantic, with the New Republic, um, so outlets that I felt could have an interest in the reporting that I was doing or the expertise that I had at that point. Um, and that was great. Um, some of them, and, and, and I went to NPR. I forgot that, sorry. Um, it was a wonderful meeting at NPR. They have a great office. <laughs> uh, and so that, that's it. And I talked to these editors and I stay in touch with some of them, um, the ones that I felt um, were interested in the work that I was doing or could offer them. And um, then uh, both in DC, but then afterwards as well in Boston, I, I met up with various organizations that cover the things that I, or, or specialize in the things that I cover, um, such as um, ones dealing with um, hate groups and um, minority um, rights and stuff like that. So that definitely, that is, the biggest benefit of this. I met um, at uh, events in Boston or Cambridge, to be precise. I met, um, uh, you know, veteran journalists like Nick Daniloff, who is uh, currently at Northeastern, um, or um, many others that I can't recall at this moment, but it was wonderful and, and it really is great. And all, the, the goal is to sort of coordinate this with the IWMF and make sure to see either whether, whether someone has collaborated with the IWMF before and they have an established relationship or if the IWMF can reach out to someone or help you reach out to someone um, who you feel could um, have, have something to say that could benefit your career. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I've done less of that in New York because I'm 
here for a shorter period of time. So I've been coming to the office every day and staying up, staying really late to be like, so I can get all the all the brownie points for being the best worker. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, I just, by the way, just got back from a HEFAT training, which is another thing that you do that, hence me having this scar on my hand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Claudia is currently, I guess, uh, still on this on the reporting trip with the fellows in Mexico, and and I was able to join the reporting fellows for a four-day HEFAT training um, where we, so hostile environment and first aid training where we were taught to do a lot of stuff that I didn't know how to do before and I feel a little bit more um, confident about punching um, <laughs> an assailant or a kidnapper in the face and yeah. knowing what to do during a kidnapping. The IWF does provide a lot of hostile environment trainings, um, mostly in Latin America, but also some in the US this year. Um, and so this year and Audrey last year were able to attend um, HEFATS as part of the Adelante Reporting Initiative. So that was a nice collaboration we were able to do across programs. Um, I'm also gonna address the second question we received today. Um, the person asked, please help with some tips on drafting the statement of interest and fellowship goals such as word count, how specific should you be? Um, so I'm just gonna briefly respond to that. We did break down the application this year into more specific questions, such as the statement of interest is no longer one large question. It's now broken down into specific things that we would like the applicant to address. And there are word count limits on each question. So that should provide in guidance for you on how how much space you have to respond. Generally, a longer response can be better because you can provide more details, more information, more background um, for the person reading your application. However, you know you want to make sure that your responses are also well crafted so that they're concise, they're not repetitive, um, and really that you're getting to the point. We've been sharing some application tips through our email uh, email blast. So I'm just going to go over those real fast. Our first tip, as I had mentioned earlier, was to start your application early. This is our largest opportunity, so there are multiple components to the application, which can take a while to complete. Um, the second is to learn first about the Elizabeth Newford Fellowship in detail before you begin responding, so that you really are familiar with um, with what you're applying for. And attending this webinar is a great way to do that. This is our first webinar that we've done. Um, some other ways that you can familiarize familiarize yourself with the fellowship is to read reporting by past fellows. Now that we have a new website at the fellows. So we republished the work of Audrey from 2017 and Una from 2018. And you can see that directly on our website. Of course, you can still look for past fellows work like Priyanka's online. Um, another tip that we would like to share is to get really clear on your goals. This is something that Priyanka has really been touching on a lot. But you know, you want to make sure that in those 500 word spaces that you might have, you really identify your goals very clearly, and that you're um, you're not making the person reading the application dig for your response. You want that response to stand out because they will be reviewing a lot of different applications. Uh, we also ask that you show your commitment to telling humanitarian stories. We want to see your work samples um, covering human rights and social justice issues. Um, and if there are more recent work samples, that's better. And we also um, encourage everyone to ask a friend or colleague to proofread your application. We understand that many people are not native English speakers who are applying, which is great. Um, however, we, if an application is full of spelling and grammar errors, that can make it difficult for the reader to understand and evaluate fairly. So if you can get that extra eye, um, pair of eyes on your application before you submit it, that can be really helpful for both you and the reader. Um, so regarding the word count limit, the guidelines are there. Um, you know, you won't be able to write more than the limit <laughs> uh, and the more that you can write in the space that you have um, can be helpful for the reader. Um, before I get to the rest of the q and I had a couple more questions for Priyanka and Una. Um, Priyanka, I was wondering what impact the fellowship has had for you personally. Um, like what are some, what are two or three concrete benefits that you've seen? Right. I, uh, I think I'll, uh, I lost you there a bit. Uh, I think you asked about how it's had, how has it impacted my life? Is that, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, it definitely gave me a sense of uh, confidence as a journalist. And, and again, I'm, I'm uh, reiterating this point uh, about confidence only because um, I was just three years into human rights reporting, whereas Una is someone who has been doing that kind of work since a much longer time. So, um, uh, so I think you know both our our backgrounds are 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 different about 
uh, about the stage in our lives and in our careers at which we 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 received this amazing fellowship uh, it definitely gave me a sense that i could reach out to people from across the world who are experts on various issues uh, i definitely had a chance of um understanding different perspectives of, of, of different subjects by attending various courses uh, across the Boston uh, um, uh, area, university area. I attended a lot of talks, you know, by a lot of people. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting. Boston has this environment that there are talks at the uh, at the Harvard, at MIT, at, at Boston College, and Emerson College, and I've definitely have mm -hmm. some lifelong friends uh, based on our conversations, and we just reconnect perhaps every six months, and we're just able to connect from where we last um, uh, had a conversation with. It's it's actually funny because as I look back now, the assignment that I am on currently right now was based is is uh, is from a connection that I had made six years ago uh, during my new for fellowship. The the Fulbright uh, uh, that I had received was also through a distant connection I had made during my new for fellowship. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that this really opens doors for you. Uh, if, if, if you're the fellow, but only as long as you decide to be proactive and you begin to sniff around as a real good reporter would and noticing uh, these, these linkages. Um, I, I definitely went out of my way to really um, seize the day, so to speak. And, and, and I remember this one particular day where I felt there's so much here to do. Uh, how am I going to do it all? And I just had this one, you know, nanosecond of calm where I just realized, okay, I'm just going to make the most of whatever I'm able to touch. And I think I definitely did that. Um, so, uh, so it's definitely impacted me in, in ways I really cannot describe other than saying it just opened doors and opportunities for me in journalism and in fields allied to journalism. Because when I was a uh, uh, Fulbright scholar, I never thought I'd end up going to a men's prison and do writing workshops with them. You know, I mean, that's I mean, that's a conversation for another time. But then all I'm trying to say is that it definitely gave me a sense of confidence that here is the world. You can do what you want to do based on who you are and the work that you have done and your voice matters. So, uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's pretty amazing as a 27 year old kid. <laughs> Thank you. And Una, um, I know you're still in the midst of your fellowship, but what impact have you seen so far? Um, and also maybe which is what are your plans post fellowship? Um, so it's, I mean, this is something that freelancers know very well. It's difficult when you're not, um, I had the, I was lucky to have been educated in a lot of American institutions. Um, I mean, or at least um, coordinated by Amer schools that had American curricula growing up. So I was able to write at a native or near, near native level um, from early on in my journalism career. But I think that the um, uh, the biggest thing that, that this fellowship gives you is for journalists who might have not usually had the opportunities to collaborate with various outlets because they come from countries where these outlets have little or no coverage or uh, might want to have more coverage, but just don't know how to who to work with or how to how to reach out to these people. This fellowship helped me gain. Um, it, it legitimized my work as a journalist um, to the point where editors would trust me with stories more. Not that they had any reason not to trust me before, but it, it made it easier for that relationship to be set up and for me to be assigned stories that I could cover. And that's been that's been sort of the biggest blessing of all this. I, I truly cannot overstate how much easier it has been for me um, to approach editors, to pitch them stories, to get um, plan things for like um, after my fellowship and stuff like that, after having been here. Um, and just, so I go back to being a freelancer with a couple of fixed contracts with um, certain outlets and, and TV uh, channels to, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and this is something I did before, except that now I have this added layer of having been um, within an American newsroom and uh, being able to craft my stories so that they are interesting for a public that is wider than the one I used to reach before. Um, while I can, I'm always, there's the, inter the international desk, I've been doing a lot of um, or contributing to explainer stories, 
that provide background to big events, such as um, things that happened lately, um, the end of the INF de- or the, the withdrawal, U.S. withdrawal from the INF deal, visits from like certain state officials that most people in the U.S. don't know anything about. So I love giving, providing background um, to wider audiences, but now I know how to craft it a lot better. And this is something that I'll be using, um, applying to the way I do my reporting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can just speak more broadly about the impact of the fellowship. In 2018, we completed a survey with the um, 13 Elizabeth Newford Fellows, everyone up to UNA. Um, and the majority of fellows responded that the fellowship had a strong strong impact on enhancing their technical skills as a journalist, increasing the depth and scope of their reporting, increasing their commitment to human rights or social justice issues, and increasing the quality of their human rights or social justice reporting. Um, past fellows, fellows continue to freelance or even work for the New York Times. Audrey, our 2017 fellow, recently wrote to the IWMF to let us know that she will continue to freelance for them. And JC, our 26, 2016 fellow, was hired as a New York Times staff journalist. Some fellows like UNA start to freelance for more US-based outlets during their fellowship. And Priyanka can attest to the fact that the new for fellows continue to stay in touch with each other over the years, providing advice and support for each new fellow who joins the cohort. Um, so at this point, I'd like to jump into some Q&A. We've received some additional comments um, on YouTube. If you're watching, you still have a question, feel free to leave your question or tweet them at us. Um, so let's get started. Um, Una, what's the proportion of reporting work that one gets to make as part of the fellowship? Um, I guess if you could speak a little bit about that balance um, when you're in Boston, you're at both MIT, but also at the Boston Globe. What was that balance like for you? It'll depend on, I mean, it'll really depend on what stories you offer the team, what the newsroom or the editor, um, and how relevant they are to the report to the events, to current events or things that are developing at that point. I mean, this is something I stressed initially when, um, with your first questions, Claudia, is that you are going to a real newsroom. This is not a test newsroom in, in, at university or school or whatever form of journalism training you might have done before, where whatever you write will be published. Um, it needs to be something that will that they'll be genuinely interested in. And this is um, something that I tried to do a lot when I was at the Boston Globe. And so it really depends, it literally depends on what, what you're doing um, and offering them. I uh, was able to realize, find my niche in that um, newsroom in the, uh, with the editorial board and uh, combine um, both writing editorials, which are unsigned, but a great experience um, since you get, get to shape the opinion of a paper. Um, and affect the way the, the public that reads the paper and is loyal to the paper as the public is that who reads who read the Boston Globe, um, be able to see how they uh, form form their opinions and also wrote op eds on other things. And um, uh, so I did. I focused a lot on my reporting. That was my goal. So everyone has a different goal and approach. Mine was to re- focus focus on re- the reporting part of it. Um, however, um, I initially neglected to or not neglected, but went to fewer panels than I'd wanted to or events that I'd wanted to because um, I thought, you know, the reporting was should be um, primary only to find out that these panels were actually the ones that gave me all these ideas for stories and angles and background information that I, that I would use in the op-eds. An op-ed is, when we're talking about these op-eds, these are not opinion column, columns in the sense of like um, when a public figure writes an opinion column. And it's like, this is my my official stance, and now everyone needs to accept it. It's more of a, here, let me give you a guided opinion on something um, that's different from a news report that's dry. So, yeah, that's that's something that, that you guys should think about a lot. Um, I, I think it's really, really, really important to go in with precise goals for what you want to do and as and and obviously this is advice that everyone gets but like read the boston globe before read the new york times before read read and not just reading interesting little stories um that you find at the bottom of the home page or something but go read the stories that the desk you'll be placed with is doing so you can when you go there you can really understand what issues they've been talking about and um in the past couple months thank you um from a logistical point of view um your time will be split kind of has, as you determine. Uh, of course, it'll depend on the capacity of um, MIT and of the globe, but that's why it is a very customizable fellowship. You'll ultimately decide how much time you spend reporting. Um, 
So for the next question, Priyanka, could you explain what courses you took at MIT or what research you did while you were there? Yeah, that, that's a very important question because um, I did research some courses on the MIT website as part of my application. And I do see that now the application definitely has a greater emphasis on the courses one would, you know, perhaps take, which is which is really good. But I. I, I reached MIT and I just, you know, remember scanning through all the websites of all the universities in the Boston area. And I see Una laughing because she knows about this, that I made a selection of 43 courses that I wanted to attend. <laughs> and uh, but and because they all just seemed so amazing and I was just so hungry to just learn different things. And finally, I um uh, skittled it down to four courses. So I did a course on introduction to gender studies at MIT, which was an undergraduate course. But then I think I, um, yeah, I, I left it midway uh, because I just realized that I had been reporting on gender issues and um, and, and I kind of became good friends with the professor and I'm, I'm still good friends with her. And, uh, but it was just good. What professor? You know, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry? What professor? Um, professor Elizabeth Wood. Oh my God, she's, she's also a professor, uh, like yeah, her. of like Russian Shout studies. She's Elizabeth. like amazing. Anyway, yeah, yeah she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was at MIT, and at Harvard School of Public Health, I took this introduction to infectious diseases by Professor Dr. Richard Cash, who is really, really amazing. He's the person who's introduced uh, introduced ORS into the world as uh, as a cheap way to uh, tackle uh, diarrhea and uh, waterborne diseases across poorer parts of the world. Uh, the third course I did was introduction to uh, photography by Professor um, Lauren Shaw at Emerson College, who is really a brilliant, brilliant person. And the fourth course, which is really interesting, was a seminar course at Tufts University, by uh, uh, which was on uh, understanding the Mexican Revolution through the uh, photography that emerged from the time. And uh, that professor uh, went on to uh, host uh, went on to curate, um, um, you know, an exhibition of Frida Kahlo's garden in one of the botanical gardens in, in, in the Bronx. So as you can imagine, it was really diverse, These all of these courses, uh, which really, you know, just burst open my mind, apart from the various um, seminars and uh, talks that I would be attending just throughout. Even to this day, I get uh, information about the various talks and lectures taking place at MIT and at Harvard, and and I cannot delete all of them because you know someday who knows they're just going to come in handy because these are people who are doing just some amazing research and. And as I work now towards being a, um, a freelance uh, foreign correspondent on 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 different topics uh, across the spectrum of human rights, uh, these will someday be very helpful as I you know research on these topics. So uh, it's uh, so I just want to emphasize that it's really up to you as a fellow to decide what you want to make out of this fellowship. The world is open out there for you. You just have to uh, go ahead and do the best you can of your time. Thank you. Our next question is more general. It says, I've been a journalist for a long time, but want to transition to human rights reporting. Previously, they were reporting on politics and culture. Um, do you have any advice on how to break into that area? So I think that's also um, speaks to a question we get a lot. Sometimes people aren't eligible yet for the fellowship because of their years of experience, or they might not have as many work samples on human rights. For those people, um, you know, I always tell them, keep in mind the application will be there next year, but what could they do in the meanwhile um, to break into human rights reporting? Can I take that question on? Because I have to leave um, uh, very soon. I'm sorry. No um, I think this was a big deal for me because I um, started sort of early on being a wire reporter or contributing to wires, which is not very fun human rights reporting unless there's a violation of some sort that needs to be reported on. So the news element needs to be there. Um, 
um, you, the easiest way to break into human rights reporting is to, to look, at, obviously look to where it's being violated um, and wh what people, what voices need to be amplified and what stories need to be told and told in a way so as to garner wider interest, both in that area, but also internationally. Um, I was, I began my career more or less in an area that had these things going on, but I didn't take a proactive role in covering these events, which is very different from covering, it's one thing when you cover an escalation of some sort um, that is newsworthy and it's different when you actually go and seek out, you're like, you, you're like an investigative reporter on human rights, basically. And you investigate and try to um, sort of um, see where and what issues need to be highlighted and haven't been highlighted and, and what politicians or or other um, influential figures have been trying to sort of hide these issues um, from from the public. Yeah. Thank you, Una, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we appreciate all of your insight. I could just, um, we'll keep following your I work. Just, uh, I just have to, I have to Sorry. go, and let me, let me, let me log out and then, and then you can continue. So <laughs> yeah. um, anyone who wants, who has additional questions and wants to feed them to me through the um, hashtag, through the IMF, uh, or th directly um, on Twitter or anywhere else, I'd be happy to answer them. This, uh, this experience has been one of the most wonderful experiences of my life, so I'm very, very happy to help any future fellow. Um, and have a wonderful day. And happy reporting. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. 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 Priyanka, you said you wanted to touch on that as well, right? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that there are uh, a lot of people who want to uh, get into human rights reporting. But again, uh, really be honest with yourself. Why do you want to get into human rights reporting? Uh, Elizabeth Neufer was someone who was really, really committed to the idea of human rights and justice and believed in bearing witness and telling the world uh, the truths that are often obliterated. Um, I, I, I'm going to say something that's going to sound very unpopular, but do not pursue human rights reporting just because you think there are prestigious fellowships out there if you do this kind of work. You know, um, yes, it might be possible that you make a natural transition in your career from writing about something that's not human rights uh, related, but still important. And then you slowly transition into this realm of reporting. And I think every reporting is important on any issue, but I think it's really comes down to asking yourself, why is it that you're pursuing what you're pursuing and have that sense of clarity on that. And I think once you feel more confident about the work that you do, it would almost seem like a natural transition in your career to apply for a fellowship like this one or others. Um, I would say if we're talking about uh, giving power to the truth or giving truth to power, it also comes down to your own personal life and in your career too. So uh, it's uh, it's I'm I'm happy to uh, chat and discuss with anyone on Twitter and 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 continue with this conversation about how can one you know do better of their human rights reporting, but uh, and and there are just no fixed rules for it. Uh, but then the only non rule is that do not get into it just because you think it's it's uh, glamorous and there are fellowships out there. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of turmoil, internal turmoil, political turmoil. Uh, it's um, it, it really comes down to being honest with yourself. And I think that's really essential. Thank you. Um, the next question is more about the structure of the fellowship. It says, what are the classes one is allowed to take, the internships and trainings available and the reporting opportunities? Um, we'll post this whole video on the website um, so you'll be able to go back. I do give an overview of the fellowship, but essentially for the first um, from September to January of each year, the fellow will be based in Boston. So they will have the opportunity to work at the Boston Globe uh, several days a week, as well as to enroll in courses at MIT's Center for International Studies or other area institutions in Boston. So that part is really flexible. Fellows in the past usually take two to three courses at a time. Um, and then they might also spend two or three days a week at the Boston Globe. This will depend on the capacity of the Boston Globe and, the MI and MIT. Um, but that's really up to you. And those kind of are the kind of the two large things available to you while you're at MIT and or other area institutions taking those courses, you'll also be um, completing an independent research project, which you'll um, highlight in your application. That'll be really open ended. It depends what you're focused on and what research would benefit you as a journalist. 
Um, and then from February until March, the fellow is based in New York, where they would be working full time at the New York Times. Um, past fellows have worked at a variety of desks. Most recently, Audrey um, and Una were more on the international desk, um, focusing on their respective regions. But again, that depends on the ca capacity of the New York Times and what you're able to propose to them to work out the best um, working arrangement between you. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, the next person asked, um, Priyanka, could you elaborate a bit more about how the academic experience or the journalism experience adds to your actual experience on human rights? Right. Um, uh, I think I, I'll, I'll address the academic experience first. Uh, I, I took a course on photography and uh, that's really helping me now as a freelance journalist when I'm uh, writing articles and also, you know, uh, photographing for my stories because uh, as it used to be back then and it continues to be now, I often find myself in places where, uh, you know, I just stumble upon a story or I'm the only journalist there. So there's really no room to be able to arrange for another collaborative photographer as much as I'd like to. So I have to really be a good photographer. So uh, taking a proper hands-on course on photography was, 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 was really helpful. And I really had a fantastic professor who just really took me under her wings. And every time I'm visiting the US, she uh, literally bullies me to having coffee with her, which I think is awesome. Um, um, and then learning from Professor Richard Cash, who introduced uh, oral rehydration system in 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 Bangladesh uh, way back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, that was helpful to learn from him about public health systems. And through him and through his connections, I understand better about public health issues in India and. And I think if, if if that's something, the kind of reporting I want to do elsewhere in the world, I'm pretty sure I'd have those connections uh, through him. Um, understanding gender issues and gender studies was uh, definitely helpful from an American perspective for me to be able to understand uh, the whole spectrum of, of, of feminism back then six years ago, which doesn't seem like a long time ago, but then again, it seems like a long time ago. Uh, and, and understanding that now when we are emphasizing on intersectionality and in a post Me Too uh, era. Um, and the last course that I um, audited was um, uh, understanding the Mexican Revolution through the photography from that time by Dr. Adriana Zavala. It, 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 it's really helped me understand this whole idea of ethics of photographing people, especially what we call as the underdog about who decides uh, who makes these photographs and who decides what's the narrative of these photographs uh, are going to be like. Uh, these were the courses that I actually attended, uh, but then, hello? Sorry, I had a connection issue, I'm yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, are we here? Yeah, okay. So um, these were the courses that I audited, but then uh, there were a lot of talks that I attended of researchers and uh, academics. Uh, another thing that was really amazing was attending this 10-day uh, course, uh, you know, uh, on inclusive security by former U.S. ambassador to Vienna, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, who's become a good friend of mine now, and who really helped me understand this idea of security from a gender perspective and beyond guns and nuclear warheads. Uh, this might all seem like I'm skirting this whole question of how did it impact my life and my career, but all I'm saying is that this really opened up a dimension that I never thought existed before or I felt that I had access to. So it, it, it really was up to me to whatever uh, events that I'd want to attend, to whatever talks that I wanted to attend. Uh, another, another great thing that I had access to was the Harvard Neiman uh, lab and, and the 12 or 20 fellows that they select every year and just understanding the different kind of journalism that you're doing in different parts of the world and just kind of trying to have conversations about where is journalism heading perhaps or or how do we uh, continue on with our craft i would say that uh it it 
I, I left the country feeling much more confident as a journalist. I left the U.S. feeling much more humble as a person, as being as as noticing that American people are not the same as the American flag and are not the same as what we see of the U.S. on television sets. And I think that was a very important thing for me to learn. And this might seem as oh, of course we know it, but but please understand this was the first time that I had. uh left the cocoon of my own country to be able to notice that and and i think that is essential because in these times when everything is so gray it's so necessary for us to be able to notice and see those gray and in between elements of every story and every perspective so i think i return home feeling uh more confused about issues but more confident about being able to tell these stories better Uh, I think that kind of answers the question, <laughs> or if it leaves you more confused, I think that's better. <laughs> Thank you. We have um, three more brief questions to get through from the Q and A, and then I'm gonna end the call because I know we're going a bit over time here. Um, so, someone asked how working in the newsroom um, helped afterwards when you went back to being a freelancer. Mm -hmm. I'd been a freelancer already for three years before the fellowship, and it was only because I was a freelancer that I had the chance to do the kind of stories that I was doing that I was able to become the fellow. Uh, and um, the newsroom experience was amazing by itself at Boston Globe, kind of similar to when I was at the editorial department where every morning uh, there was a discussion about the big news of the day and what everyone could and 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 what's the perspective that was missing or needed to be or 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 needed to be added that was you know uh, in 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 that whole discussion and and peter was really amazing in always asking me is there something you'd like to add and this was my chance to talk about matters that were developing in india and to say that this is important to be written about because it has global ramifications or even not if it uh, even not to be able to convey it as this is something that's happening in india but but then it has implications around the world or it matters like for example there was um the 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 fire in the garment factory in bangladesh at that time So it it might seem far removed from what was happening in the U.S., but again, it just mattered, and so I was able to write something about it. Uh, at at New York Times, it was a much shorter period that I had of about four weeks, and so I was again in a new city, had to adjust to a new place, and because I had my background as a crime reporter, it was fantastic to be. Uh, spending a couple of days at one PP, which is the police headquarters, and you know, just see you know uh, crime reporters there. And it took me a while to work on one story, just because I had to try and understand the systems of the story that I was that I was trying to do with the institutions and everything. But overall, it was a um, really good experience. But I personally felt that the experience at Boston Globe was much more. uh helpful only because i was able to spend more time with it mm -hmm. um coming back home i have to be honest i thought i would just have a job waiting mm -hmm. for me because mm -hmm. of this amazing fellowship but it wasn't so because the indian media uh sen scenario was such that they really didn't care much about what you had brought back or you know or if you had this fellowship so there wasn't like a job waiting for me and that kind of made me a bit depressed initially but i feel that wait a second i have this amazing experience behind me i'm going to use this to continue to further on my reporting about human rights issues in india in a broader and much more confident mm -hmm. way so it, it it was a dip when i came back home but then now as i realize in sub, uh, after subsequent fellowships i just know to be able to use those things that i've learned to be able to do either one collaborative work or work that continues to further on the existing reporting that i'm doing from india yes um and it's important to note that in more recent years fellows have extended their time at the new york times to 8 weeks of course this will always depend on the capacity of the new york times and you will still be at the boston globe for much more time than you will be at the new york times um but that's just a change we've had over the years um So another question for you, Priyanka. Just two more left. Why do you think that you were selected among the candidates? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I well, 
I didn't get to see what the other 85 applicants wrote <laughs> in their application. And I remember uh, being one of the finalists, one among the three, and we had a long, you know, one hour interview with, I think, five or six people on the other side. And I was at someone's house during this interview and I was just walking around because the house was just full of mosquitoes. So, so I don't know if that <laughs> helped, but uh, jokes aside, once I got to the US, I just realized that coming from India, uh, uh, so what had happened was that I think there were several applications from India and I think a lot of them were quite similar or, or, or people were reporting or, uh, or applying uh, or, or had done similar kind of uh, stories and had similar background. I had been reporting about something that was somewhat unheard of at that time, which was about the uh, about the uh, forceful land grab of indigenous people's forest land. And that's something, a story that hadn't reached American shores yet. And in a way, it resonated perhaps with uh, with American history. But I don't think so. It was just because of the American history that it made sense. You know, I, I definitely don't want to just say it's just because of that. But I think I had uh, recommendations from editors who had really seen my work up, up close and they just knew about uh, the ways that I had gone about with my reporting and and the risks I had and the personal risks I had undertaken to do some of the reporting. Uh, in no way am I saying that please put your life at risk to be able to get your work done and thereby get a fellowship. But um, honestly, I don't know why I received the fellowship. Uh, but I definitely feel that my application was strong enough. And I think that's one point that I want to make, which, which correlates to a previous point you had made, was that even though English is kind of like my first language, I had uh, friends to take a look at my application and to give me critical feedback. So it doesn't matter whether English is your first or second language for someone to help you with it, but to be able to really give you that, you know, outsider view about what is missing and what's lacking. And I think the application process right now is so much more simpler because your statement of purpose has been divided into so many more questions. So uh, it's, it's, it's even more easier now for someone to be able to craft a really strong uh, application. But uh, but I'd been applying for many other uh, you know fellowships and grants also, and I got some of them subsequently. Uh, but then I think it really boils down to feeling confident about your work and just being able to con convey that confidently about how it matters to you and how it matters in in the scope of reporting that you have been doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question, I can answer this from an IWMF perspective, but I'll let you respond first. Does have a background, does having a background in human rights advocacy work in addition to journalism help? Huh. Okay. Um, you know, when Trump was elected, I was uh, very uh, piqued to see a lot of uh, journalists write a joint statement uh, that they are not just going to buy everything that Trump says. And they're going to be, uh, you know, much more discerning about whatever he's going to say. And that was interesting because that almost felt like advocacy to me. And six years ago, when I was uh, when I was uh, on this fellowship, I remember somebody telling me that, oh, so you don't believe in objectivity and stuff like that. I, I personally think that you can be objective in your reporting process, but there's no objectivity per se. Having said that. I've always uh, identified myself as a journalist and not as an advocacy person. Um, it, it might help somebody, it may not help, but then I think in the end, this is a fellowship for journalists. So taking whatever tools you have to inform your journalism better. So if you have a medical background, if you are a medical doctor who's now reporting on public health issues effectively, I think by all means definitely apply for it if you think that comes under the realm of human rights reporting. Uh, all I'm saying is that if advocacy is something, if your background in advocacy is helping you to be a better journalist, go for it. But then it, it doesn't have to be that you, I mean, advocacy is not a bad word. And, and, and that's something I was really happy to see when 
uh, when the when the what uh, when the White House journalist put out that statement, you know, because it almost seemed like advocacy, but then it it it. It's a fine thin line, which I think is it's it's really helpful for us as journalists to be able to see. Uh, but but uh, in in the case of this uh, fellowship and the application, uh, bring in whatever you have as your tools to inform your own journalism better, any which ways, or because of this fellowship or notwithstanding this fellowship too. Thank you. Um, do you have any more comments or anything else you want to say before I wrap up the call? <laughs> Well, um, nothing much really. I'm just happy that we're having this because <laughs> I, I definitely get a lot of questions from a lot of people and I'm just glad that they reached out to me. But I just want to read the application process uh, uh, in detail to not miss out on it. And I think if you miss out some elements, it just speaks for uh, yourself as a reporter. I think the application process is so much more simpler now with, with, with you know, so many more questions. And uh, really ask yourself, why are you applying for this? Why are you, why are you doing human rights uh, reporting? And again, I'd be happy to take uh, some more questions if need be on the, on the Twitter thread. Uh, but I think we've covered everything. But again, do not do not think of this fellowship as something that's in, in which you'll be spoon fed different opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity. It's your and it's your time, and you've just got to uh, make the best of it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all your wonderful wisdom and insight. Um, I just want to point people to some resources on the IWMF website on the homepage. You can always see all of our open opportunities. Right now, you'll see the Elizabeth Newford Fellowship is open until March 7th. Um, if you click onto the new for page, you'll be able to access the blog. Um, it ha since our website was redesigned two years ago, it has blog posts from the two most recent fellows, Audrey and Una, where they write about some some personal reflections about the experiences they have during their fellowship. Um, and there's also a reporting section on the website, which has reporting by all IWMF fellows and grantees, including um, the two most recent NUFER fellows. You can also sign up for the IWMF newsletter at the bottom of our website. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram um, on email and on social media. That's where we send out information about our upcoming opportunities. Um, we want to thank everyone who joined us today, and hopefully we'll be able to add this um, webinar to our website as a future resource for folks. Um, thank you so much, Priyanka. It was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for hosting this. And again, if any questions, please do send it out to us. And good luck with your journalism and reporting and this fellowship application. Yes, thank you so much. I hope to receive your applications. <laughs> Talk to you all later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.